Hey, so hello and welcome to the latest in our Work Well Live webinar series. So the goal of these uh, Work Well webinars is to share ideas, information, advice, you know, anything that can support and promote healthy work environments for everyone. That's our goal. Uh, live, live webinars are just one, one part of what we do here at the Work Well community. We also have podcasts. There's the Work Well podcast. We have articles. There's a private forum, so if you have any questions, you can go online and ask some questions there. You might get a response from the group. Um, online, we have an online education hub that's called the WorkWell Institute. We have a number of programs there, including uh, there's a program on our it's our eight step framework for developing a workplace wellness program that lasts. That's for well-being leaders. There's also a program for creating a team of well-being champions, and there's others up there too. Now, onto our session for today. So the recently published Code of Practice on the right to disconnect envisages the creation of a culture in which employees feel they can disconnect from work and work-related devices. But what does that mean? So what does that really mean you know, in real terms for employers and employees? So here to discuss those practical implications and to set out key action steps I'm delighted to welcome Alvi Dennehy. Alvi is partner in William Fry's Employment and Benefits Department. Alvi regularly acts for clients before the Workplace Relations Commission, the Labour Court and the Civil Courts. And Alvi frequently lectures on current employment law issues and contributes to employment law publications also. So Alvi, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Great, thanks, Brian. Thanks so much for that introduction and for inviting me to discuss this very topical issue, the right to disconnect at today's webinar. Uh, so I thought I'd just set the scene a little bit for everybody. Um, and if you wouldn't mind popping up my slides when you get a chance. Oh, yeah, 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 no problem. Oh. Well, well, I'll tell you what, I've got, I've got some poll questions. Will I pop them up first and then we'll sure. we'll get into your presentation just to, just to get a, a feeling for who's on the call maybe. So everyone should be seeing the questions that are up on screen now, first of all, I'm just, we're asking if and the, the live recording doesn't share the, um, the question. So we're asking the question, are people currently, uh, what's the current situation? Are you working from home? Are you in back in the office or the factory? Is it a mix for you at present? And then maybe just the, in the future, your preference, what are your preferences? And we've, we've asked this one before, but I think it's interesting to get an update on it. Um, are you looking to work from home full time in the future? Would you prefer to work uh, from work full time or perhaps a mix? And then finally, and it's really related to our session today and, and your own slides, uh, Alvi, is since the beginning of the pandemic, have you found it harder to disconnect from work? Have you found it maybe easier um, or have you not noticed a difference? So this is great. I'm seeing lots of votes coming in. I'll give everyone another uh, just 30 seconds or so, uh, so everyone can have their vote. Have your say. <clears throat> okay, great. So I think we're, we're, well, we're well over 85% have voted now. Oh, coming up to 90%. Let's go. For, let's get 90% here. Oh, someone's taking the vote away, so we've dropped down 1%. We're back up to 89, and I'm going to call it now. So... That's pretty good. So listen, I'm going to share those results. Okay, so yeah, a whopping 87% are still working from home. Minor, minor percentage uh, back in back in work. And 11% is a mix. So a very clear indicator there. Um, now, here, here's an interesting one. So yeah, that's no surprises, I think. So the preference going forward is for a hybrid, is for that hybrid approach, 74%. So three quarters of people looking for that hybrid approach. Um, and, and then, a, you know, a sizable 23% saying they'd like to work from home full time, but a tiny percentage looking to work from, from work full time, if you like. And then, yeah, again, no surprises, perhaps 62% uh, saying that since the beginning of the pandemic, they found it harder to disconnect from work. 10% um, interestingly saying they found it easier. And then 28% not noticing any difference. Okay, listen, brilliant. Thanks for sharing that. I think I've got one more poll later in the session. Uh, but I think that's a, hopefully that sets a bit of a foundation for you, Alvino. I'll, I'll get your slides up and I, I'll, I'll hand over to you. That's great. Thanks so much. That's perfect. Thanks, Ryan. <clears throat> 
we can actually stay on the main page that's okay sure. perfect thanks Amal. um so as i said earlier thanks so much brian for inviting me here to talk about this very topical issue but i did want to start by setting the scene um, as a society, we've been gradually evolving from the traditional nine to five, clock in, clock out approach to our workspace and our work environment. And technology in the last few decades, as we all know, has been a game changer in this evolution to the digital, uh, the digital workplace. So instead of waiting for the postman or indeed postwoman uh, to deliver mail in the morning, we can now communicate instantly via email. Equally, instead of waiting until we go into the office to power up our computer or our laptop, we're now able to check emails, whether we're sitting on the couch watching TV, during mealtimes, at your son's soccer game or your daughter's ballet recital. So in short, we are constantly connected, regardless of not being physically at work. And with this perpetual plug-in comes changed expectations. So if you're checking your emails out of hours, is there an expectation that you should be responding to those emails, doing your job outside your normal weekly working hours? And so this vicious circle begins and we start seeing a, a phrase that I know many of you will have heard many times during the pandemic, these blurred lines between working hours and home hours. And this inability, I suppose, to, to say you're not just working from home, but are you also living at work? And it goes without saying that the ongoing pandemic has certainly been a catalyst here, almost overnight for a significant majority of the workforce, as we can see even um, even still today from your, your panel question, Brian, uh, was have, we've been propelled to working from home, some of us for the very first time ever. And I think what began back in March 2020 as something of, dare I say it, a social experiment um, where everyone, including myself, took up baking banana bread and dialing into Zoom Pilates, binge watching Tiger King on Netflix, or maybe that's just me. Uh, it's now led to many employees, <laughs> it's led to many employees admitting to being burnt out uh, trying to juggle work life and home life and this really crucial issue of an inability to actually disconnect, an inability to put the phone down, step away from the device and have that very important piece of rest and downtime. So last month, as Brian mentioned, the Code of Practice on the Right to Disconnect was launched by the government, and it's aiming to assist both employers and employees in respecting employees' well-being by facilitating this right to switch off from work. So if I could just go to the next slide. Thanks, Brian. So the code is designed the code here is designed for a, to create a culture in which employees feel they can disconnect from work and work related devices and the code has five key aims that i'm just going to run through very briefly the first aim is to complement and support employers and employees existing rights and obligations under existing legislation working time legislation health and safety legislation the second aim is to assist employers and employees in navigating this digital uh, this digital landscape, this digital working environment that now includes remote working and flexible working. The third aim is to assist employees who feel obligated to routinely work longer hours than are set out in their agreed terms and conditions of employment or their contract of employment. The fourth um, objective, the fourth aim is to assist employers in developing and implementing procedures and policies that will facilitate this right to disconnect. And the fifth and final aim of the code is to provide guidance for the resolution of workplace issues that arise in connection with trying to exercise this right to disconnect. Uh, next slide please, Ryan, thanks. So let's look at the basics first before we dive right in. The code defines the right to disconnect as an employee's right to be able to disengage from work and refrain from engaging in work-related electronic communications, such as emails, telephone calls or other messages outside normal working hours. And to do this, the code has identified three key elements or three key rights um, that kind of connect to, uh, no pun intended, connect to this right to disconnect. So the first is a right not to routinely work outside your normal work uh, working hours. The second one is a right not to be penalized or punished where you refuse to work outside your normal working hours. And the third is not so much a right, but a duty to respect each other's right to disconnect, to respect your colleagues' rights and so on and so forth. And significantly, and this is an important point, the code does acknowledge that there are certain limited circumstances where employers should be able to reach out to employees outside of their working um, hours. And we'll get into that in a little bit more detail later on. But the point to make here is that while that's recognized, this should be the exception and not the rule. Next slide, please, Ryan, thanks. 
So the first key takeaway I want to impart upon you today is the fact that um, the code places obligations on both the employer and significantly the employees. So this is not a one way street with employers shouldering the full burden of making sure the right to disconnect is respected and implemented and, and the code of practice is, is adhered to. There's actually a mutuality here. And what I've done in this particular slide is set out the different obligations that um, are connected, shall I say, to employers and the obligations that are connected to employees. Now, I don't propose um, running through all of these in detail. Um, some of them are very self-evident, but I'll pick out a couple. Um, so for example, an employer is under an obligation to provide detailed information to employees on their working hours. This is not a new obligation. In fact, this obligation is set out and enshrined in statute back as far as 1994, the Terms of Employment Information Act, and more recently, the 2018 Miscellaneous Provisions Act. And in short, it entitles employees to receive in writing proper details of what their expected working hours are going to be. So nothing new here. Uh, the second one that I'll pick out here is this requirement or obligation on employers to keep an adequate record of working time and rest breaks. Again, this is not a new obligation. This was already enshrined back in 1997 with the Organisation of Working Time Act. So while these obligations um, appear new in terms of the format, in terms of the code of practice format, they're really just picking up on existing obligations under existing legislation. Uh, turning very briefly to look at the employee's obligations, and this is an important one, um, employees themselves are required to manage their own working time and they're required to uh, ensure that they take the rest breaks that they're entitled to, their, their daily and weekly rest breaks and their annual leave. And the code expressly mentions that if an employee for whatever reason is unable to take a break, there's an onus on that employee to raise that in writing with their employer and look to see what can be done in terms of ensuring the employee can avail of the rest break at, at, at a later stage. Um, so I'll just go to the next slide if I can. Thanks, Brian. So the second key point I wanted to make before we get into the granular detail of the action steps that are recommended for employers in connection with implementing this code of practice, one point I want to upfront in lights is that a failure to follow the code or a breaching the code, for example, is not in and of itself an offence in the same way a breach of the working time legislation or health and safety legislation could give rise to an employee claim, which could in turn um, give rise to various kind of uh, modes of redress before, for example, the WRC or the Labour Court. However, this does not mean that employers have carte blanche to disregard the code or pay it some form of lip service or tokenism, quite the opposite. And this is the point I wanted to really bring home. Uh, so this particular code of practice, as is the case with other codes of practice, for example, the, I think it was the 2000 um, code of practice on disciplinary and grievance procedures, while they're not strictly speaking legally binding, they expressly provide that they non or failure to adhere to the terms of the code can be used in evidence against the employer during the, during the hearing of a different claim. So for example, if you have an employee who has raised a grievance um, informal or formal uh, in relation to their right to disconnect or wh whatever's happening internally that they've not been able to properly disconnect, if that employer ultimately chooses to resign and take a claim for constructive dismissal, for example, um, that would be under the unfair dismissals legislation before the WRC, um, that employee is entitled to point to the fact that the employer may have failed to properly implement the terms of these this code of practice or adhere to the principles of the code in terms of the implementation and really honouring it as opposed to, as I said earlier, paying it lip service. And the adjudication officer hearing that um, claim can take that evidence into account when making its determination as to whether the claim is uh, well-founded or not. So very important to um, definitely get to get to grips with this code of practice and to very much check back on it and um, when you're preparing your, your um, right to disconnect policy which brings us very neatly into my next Ali, slide. Could I, could I just ask you a question there? Of course. Do you, do you think sh should the government have gone a step further and actually made it uh, into legislation as opposed to simply a code of practice? Any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, it's it's an interesting question, um, and I know we, we'll touch on this later on, but uh, the government, as part of its remote working strategy, is looking at bringing in legislation for um, 
a legal right to request remote working, for example, and putting that on a statutory footing for the first time. Um, in terms of its rationale behind looking to have um, a code of practice here instead of um, a piece of legislation, I imagine it's because it's such a new and innovative concept to actually try and implement this and build it into our, our current work practice. It's, it needed to be a little bit more malleable, it needed to be a little bit more flexible, and um, at the same time, not um, a nice to have, certainly a must have, but I imagine that the, the guidance around this is, is designed to help you from a best practice perspective, start doing things correctly. And then bearing in mind as well, as I said a moment ago, a lot of these obligations and a lot of these issues for employers are actually already on a legislative footing. They're already in the Organisational Working Time Act, the Terms of Employment Act, the um, Health and Safety at Work Act. So I suppose to a certain extent, technically there wasn't a need for separate legislation. And this is almost a consolidation or an arms around approach to bring these obligations together in the mindset of disconnection, kind of on foot of the pandemic and so forth. And um, I think that's probably why. Okay. Um, we have to check with the government, of course. Yeah. The, <laughs> <I'll work on laughs> you know, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, thanks for that. No problem. Um, so moving on to the, the next slide, if I can, Brian. Thanks so much. Uh, so the code sets out a number of practical steps that employers can take to ensure compliance with its principles. And the main action point here is going to be probably for the first time for many of us to prepare a right to disconnect policy. Now the code of practice very helpfully actually has a template policy in the code of practice for anybody who's, um, who's had a chance to read it. And while that is, as I said, very useful for, um, for employers, um, I would caution that I would take this as a starting position rather than an end position. And let me explain why. Um, these, this particular policy, it needs to be um, tailor-made. There's no one size fits all. Uh, one business um, versus another business will have different needs, different approaches to, to flexible working time. Some businesses will work across um, different time zones, for example. So the message here is absolutely take the template policy that's within the, um, the code of practice itself, but that is a starting position for you to build on. And the code actually expressly recommends proactively engaging with your own employees and employee representatives when it comes to, to preparing this code to make sure it really is fit for purpose and that it suits that particular organization's business needs and workforce um, workforce demands. So the policy should um, do a number of things and I'll do a quick whistle stop tour through them. Um, but the first and foremost, um, taking you back to my first key takeaway point, the policy should clearly differentiate and set out the obligations of the employer and the obligations of the employees uh, when it comes to respecting this particular right to disconnect. Um, the policy should also expressly state that there's an expectation that employees will disconnect when they're on holidays, that they will disconnect when they're outside of their normal working hours, at home watching TV, for example, uh, rather than staying semi-connected to the workplace via your, your smartphone. Um, the policy should also address um, practical issues that will arise. As I said, where employers work across multiple time zones, how will that work in practice? What can we do to make sure we are respecting everybody's right to disconnect when um, it could be a certain time in Brazil and a certain time in Dublin? How is that all going to work? Um, as I said earlier, the, the code does recognise that there are going to be occasional scenarios where there's a legitimate um, entitlement, shall I say, on the part of the employer to reach out to employees that are technically off the clock. And the code gives some examples for this, um, such as where the employer is trying to put together a roster for, for the following couple of weeks, or where um, an employee is called in sick and the employer might be reaching out to that employee to say, do you want to come in, pick up this shift, etc. So there's definitely reasonable reasons that you can still reach out to your, your employees and your workforce. Um, now the policy does go on, or sorry, the code does go on to say that your policy should also recognise that there are going to be um, limited circumstances where for business or operational needs, there is um, an entitlement again for that employer to reach out to the employee. And this will be very dependent on the fact circumstances. So for example, um, the employee's role, the seniority of that role, uh, the needs of customers and clients in that particular business, and indeed what's set out in the employee's contract. If, if you're dealing with a very senior employee and their contract more or less says that they are controlling their own working hours, but those working hours may end up including weekends, and it's up to that employee to manage that and manage their own rest breaks. Um, other points to, to bear in mind when you're preparing your uh, right to disconnect policy is that it should include a complaint procedure. Now, this doesn't mean we need to 
in reinvent the wheel and create an entirely new uh, complaint procedure, but rather there should be a natural connection between this right to disconnect policy and your um, informal and formal grievance procedure within your employment handbook. Um, lastly, uh, not necessarily lastly, but the code also recommends that it should you should review your policy at least annually, and that's to make sure it's still fit for purpose, that it's still effective, that it's still doing what it needs to do. So something um, as simple as just um, once, once a year on the anniversary or the birthday of, of the day you launch your policy, checking it, um, engaging with employees, how's it all working, etc., is also recommended to keep it fit for purpose. So look, this policy needs to be clearly drafted. It needs to be um, easily understood by, by all employees. And also it needs to be easily accessible. So there's absolutely no point in drafting an absolutely beautiful textbook A++ version of your right to disconnect policy. If nobody sees it, um, it hasn't been rolled out, no one knows where to find it. So it's all about making sure that it's clear, um, understood, well understood and easily accessible. So moving I, on to the next. I, I have a question on the policy. I might just kind of get the pulse uh, for people that are uh, listening in uh, about, about the policy document itself. Maybe if some people are really ahead of the game, maybe some already have a policy in place. So I'm asking that, have you got a policy in place for the right to disconnect? Is it something you're working on? Perhaps that's why you're, you're tuning in today and maybe, maybe you haven't started on it yet. So if everyone could just maybe... Give it 10 more seconds, it's fantastic. We got a really engaged bunch here, Aldi, because they were they were quick off the mark there. We're up at we're up at almost 70% here already having replied. So I'll just give it another uh, few seconds there. But it's certainly it's kind of looking mixed here between people working on, on the policy at, at present and then people that haven't started yet. And there's a there's a small cohort there that are that are boxing above their weight that have already got the uh, policy in place which is fantastic just like four percent so i'm going to end the polling here thanks to everybody we've got over 80 percent there that's fantastic so people are actually paying attention to us which is always always nice to know right. uh, so there we go yeah four percent have got it in place already which is which is great uh, great work um and then pretty much split between those that are working on the policy and those that haven't started as yet so i'm sure the information you just provided there albie is going to be uh, really really useful and what i will do as well i will share that link to the the templates that the WRC has. I'll, I'll make sure that's included in the link that goes out with this um, with this recording. No, that's very interesting, and and I'm actually surprised that the, there are four percent um, of our listeners that already have this right to disconnect um, policy, which is probably well ahead of the game. And I'm, I'd be curious actually as to whether. Um, any of those existing policies need to be updated to reflect the new code of practice or whether they're uh, streaks ahead of, of, of everybody else at the moment. Um, but just very interesting stats. Yeah. Um, so moving on to the next slide. Uh, so quite apart from the policy, which I think is going to be the big ticket item in terms of action points, and um, there's a few other action points that I thought were worth, um, worth running through uh, for the purposes of today's webinar. Uh, so the first um, the first action point here after the policy is going to be training. And I know this kind of always goes hand in hand with any policy, but training, training and more training, I think um, I can't recommend it highly enough in terms of uh, evidencing your kind of willingness to respect the right to disconnect and to ensure that both managers and employees are properly trained to really understand um, you know, what the right to disconnect means in practice and really understand the content content and effect of this right to, dis to disconnect policy. So this training should absolutely emphasize the mutuality of obligations that we discussed earlier and a sense, and there should be a sense of, of openness and understanding that comes, comes out by way of output, shall I say, of this training where there is this sense of open dialogue that there isn't a taboo um, type of um, label attached to topics such as rest breaks, working hours, uh, time management, that there should be a great sense of um, being able to raise this with your manager, being able to easily touch on the right to disconnect. And the more transparency and the more um, open communication we have about this is certainly to be recommended and is recognised in, in the code of practice as well. Uh, the next point is um, to review your time recording mechanism. This is always a bit of a hot topic um, when we're discussing things like working hours and rest breaks, because as I said earlier, back since 1997, the Organisation Working Time Act, there is an obligation on employers to have an adequate or keep an adequate record of working hours and rest breaks. And this perhaps would have been quite easy back in 1997 when people were working, you know, nine to five, uh, in and out, clocking in, etc. It's much more difficult today, if not, um, let's be fair, 
borderline impossible um, to keep track of employees that you're not even physically in the same building of to see whether they are working excessive hours. Are they really taking their daily breaks? Are people working through lunch? Are they working into the wee hours of the night? Um, so th when I say something as blithe as have a time recording mechanism, I completely appreciate it's not as easy as that. And this is, I think, going to be a growth area for employers in Ireland to consider, well, how do we marry our statutory obligation, which is already there, and probably a lot of employers are in technical breach of that already. And there has been case law, actually, I'm happy to discuss it if anyone is more interested, but there have been cases that um, before the Labour Court where that particular issue of failure to keep your records um, has gone in favour of the employee in taking claims under the working time legislation uh, with awards of um, financial compensation. So uh, in terms of what, what we can do, look, there's going to be software options. Um, you know, there's always going to be a tech solution to something like this. And I think there's only going to be more and more software options that will look to, to, support, um, to support employers in terms of this time recording. Uh, something as simple as sending regular emails, maybe once a week, maybe once every two weeks, uh, by way of reminder to your employees where you say, look, just make sure you're taking um, taking these breaks and those breaks and so on. Um, and just again, going back to the, the, the policy itself, having that complaint procedure in place. So if an employee is feeling that they're starting to routinely work outside of working hours, and perhaps we don't have the right visibility of that because we don't have the perfect time recording mechanism just yet, and that there are ways of addressing that and looking to um, looking to solve those problems. Uh, so just the next slide, please, Brian, if I can. Great, two more action points. Um, so this is to review your contract of employment templates. Now, again, these may already be absolutely um, textbook per perfect, but what you're looking for here is to make sure that the contract of employment that you're using for new hires um, already does what it needs to do in terms of clearly setting out uh, the employee's core working hours and the expectations on the employee when it comes to normal uh, working hours. Again, just to reiterate, this is not a new requirement. This is very much already set out in legislation, but it's a recommended um, action step now off the back of this code of practice. Uh, the last point then is to look at your email policy. And so one, one, a couple of suggestions from the Code of Practice in terms of emails, um, recognising, I suppose, that a lot of employees like to work flexibly, um, and equally the, the earlier point I made around employees uh, working across different time zones, it may well suit somebody to send an email in Los Angeles at 7 a.m. that comes in to Ireland at, actually I have no idea of the time difference, but comes in at some ungodly hour. Um, and I think the, the advice from, from the, uh, the Code of Practice is to be cognizant of, of those different working patterns or working arrangements. And the suggestion is to include uh, footers at the end of your email where it, something along the lines of, it suits me to send this email at this time, but I'm not expecting a response. So just to take that urgency out of the communication that if someone has checked it, there isn't an automatic expectation that they will then be on the clock needing to respond to it immediately. Um, and one other um, idea, shall I say, that the Code of Practice mentioned, and I've actually seen it uh, already implemented in, in William Fry just last week, um, is a sort of a pop-up message. So when you're drafting an email out of hours for whatever reason, a pop-up message will come up on your email that says, do you really need to send this email right now? Do you want to consider delaying it and having it sent, uh, you know, kind of, nine o'clock tomorrow morning, etc. And it did give me cause to pause. And normally I would be firing out emails whatever time. Um, but I think that's the purpose of these pop-ups. It's just that that little step back, that little moment where you think, actually, yeah, there is a, a disconnect here, a disconnect um, piece here. If I send this email, am I kind of triggering somebody's um, inability to disconnect um, by sending it at this hour rather than delaying it and sending it in the morning? So a very good practical thing I've already seen under William Fry um, and hopefully something that um, other businesses will, will want to, to mirror. So last slide, I think, Brian. Almost there. Thanks. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, um, in January 2021, the government launched its national remote work strategy, and this code of practice was just one element of that, um, that strategy, which aims to really set out the government's plans and objectives when it comes to remote working. And as everyone knows, the plan is that remote working will become a permanent fixture on the Irish working landscape. Um, so the, other, the, po the point I was going to make, which we've discussed already, is just this other limb to the, uh, the national remote work strategy, which is the plan to, to legislate for a statutory right to request remote working, so to really kind of copper fasten 
that right and bring it into the kind of uh, the more formal footing um, in statute. And just to let you know, for anyone who is tracking it, the public consult consultation process in relation to this particular piece of legislation closed just last uh, last Friday. So we'll wait and see what the kind of output is, is from there in terms of moving things along. On the European front, again, I'm sure many of you are aware that in January of this year, the European Parliament published its uh, proposed new directive on an EU directive on the right to disconnect. And this is most likely going to add further weight to Ireland's own code of practice. So it's all going in one direction at a European level and, and further fields, of course, as well, that this is not something that is going to be a tick the box and we'll forget about it. It's very much going to live with us as part of our normal approach to working hours and working environments. Uh, so in summary, um, the code is a useful step forward, um, in my view, when it comes to assisting employees in managing their work-life balance and in turn their own well-being. However, a flexible and, again, pardon the pun, well-balanced approach with buy-in significantly from both employers and employees will be required to really ensure the effectiveness of the code. So that's the end of my whistle-stop tour and I'm very happy to take any questions. Hey, Alvi, yeah, thanks so much for that. Uh, really informative. So uh, th there's all these details there and I can share them with anyone uh, afterwards as well who, who, might, uh, who might have any kind of further questions. Um, yeah, so we got some questions already. So people send questions in, in advance. So if anyone has any further questions, please pop them in the q and I'm seeing one or two pop in already, which is great. I'm just going to stop the sharing here. So Alvi, so I mean, what I took from that, quite a few things. Um, I suppose the, the main thing jumping out at me was the three E's. So evidence, evidence, evidence. Whether you're an employer or an employee, it, this is about capturing the evidence of, of what you're doing, and maybe I guess if you're an employee, <laughs> what your employer is not doing. And then it's the ca a case of bringing a case to the Workplace Relations Commission if, if necessary. No, I think that's right. And I think, look, I, I know I mentioned earlier in terms of that, that um, code of practice on the disciplinary and grievance procedures back from 2000. I mean, that code of practice, just to give you um, a sort of an, an example, it's 21 years old. And yet it's still mentioned in cases that we see before the Workplace Relations Commission when it comes to employees not receiving full and fair procedures during, for example, a disciplinary process that they weren't accompanied by a fellow colleague and so on and so forth. So even though it's it's quite an old code and it's never been updated per se, the ethos of it very much lives on. And the fact that it's cited in so many cases and forms the basis for so many decisions for adjudication officers lends itself to, or lends itself to um, the kind of conclusion that this is going to be the same in the context of the code of practice. So any claims that employees have been taking to date uh, in terms of breaches of working time where they feel they don't have a safe place of work or even things like personal injuries claims where they feel that they're suffering from work-related stress, etc. This particular element or, or armory on the part of the employer, and maybe that's a better way of looking at it now, is that by putting in place a proper right to disconnect policy and by sticking to your script and really living and breathing it, not just having it looking pretty in a document or on an internet somewhere, is going to go some way towards helping any employer defending these types of claims. And equally, if you do have a policy in place and it's not being stuck to, it's going to go some way in helping an employee make that claim and cementing that claim when they want to get redressed from the WRC. Sure, and yeah, that, makes, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, quite a few uh, questions coming in now, which is great. Um, let me see, just pick out the, the one for the earliest. Um, there's one a question on what, what kind of awards are we talking about if, for breach of not keeping proper working time records? Yeah, okay. Um, so, so the main case that, that we have here, and I won't get into it um, in, in too much detail, but uh, it was a lady called Gronio O'Hara and Keypac uh, mm -hmm. was the name of the company. Uh, long story short, she was a sales um sales executive, she was on the road all day and she'd come home at night, plug into the computer, typing up sales reports, etc. And her employer could see that. She'd be emailing the employer kind of at midnight every night saying, here's the, the stats or the sales report, etc. And ultimately the case that she took was um, around this breach of, of working time and, and working excessive hours and so forth. And the decision taken by the adjudication officer there, bearing in mind this is obviously pre the right to disconnect code of practice was that the employer was on notice by seeing these emails coming in at you know dawn or midnight or whatever it was that the employer was on notice and basically ignored it basically pushed it to one side and said well she wants to work that's her own business and uh, so t didn't take the ownership of the situation and the decision held if I'm re remembering it correctly that they effectively permitted her 
to work outside um, normal working hours and not take rest breaks. And the decision of the Labour Court here was that there was a technical breach um, of the working time legislation. And the only thing that would have saved the employer was if they had been in a position to produce timesheets that showed that she actually was taking breaks and she was um, only working X hours. And they didn't have a system in place. They weren't able to do that. And just to, to answer your question in terms of the level of fines, um, in that particular instance, it was seven and a half thousand or, or 8,000 euro. So we're not talking about ridiculous fines. And I'll give you one other example in a moment, just by way of comparison. But if you think about the number of employees you might have, and if everybody took that claim, bear in mind, they don't need to be dismissed to take this claim. They could take this claim today, for example, while still in employment. Um, you could be adding up a lot of um, technical statutory breaches. And just to finish the point in terms of um, uh, other awards, um, just by way of comparison, in France, there was a really meaty award a couple of years back, I think of 60,000 um, euro, uh, where an employer, Renticule, I think, um, had breached, and actually France has some right to disconnect uh, legislation in place, but the employer had effectively forced the employee to keep his phone on at all times to answer uh, client queries. So, of course, he could never disconnect because he was literally um, always connected. So €60,000 was awarded by the French Supreme Court in that case, just by way of comparison. Yeah, no, really interesting kind of practical examples there, kind of case studies. And that, that was another question. How are we doing um, compared to you know, other countries? So you, you touched on the EU directive that's, that's coming. Yep. Uh, France, I, I believe, we're the first country in the world to make this. They've actually brought it into law, into legislation, if I'm not mistaken. They have. Yeah, no, they have. So France has a piece of legislation now. It's, uh, it's questionable as to what the sort of the, the teeth are around there. There's, there's not technically an automatic sanction, as I understand it. And don't quote me because I'm not qualified to give French mm -hmm. legal advice. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly in terms of that particular award, um, that's starting to show a little bit more teeth um, and a little bit more um, scope, I think, for employers to, to sit up and take this more seriously. So France is obviously a very different jurisdiction and a different approach to a lot of employment law situations. But I do think that the connect the dot here for us is going to be that European directive when there's going to be a minimum base for every country in Europe and we will all need, and it may well be that Ireland is going to be ahead of this particular game, hopefully it will be. It certainly was back in 1998 when it introduced the Employment Equality Act. We were, we were way ahead of the game then. So maybe we're ahead of the game now, um, quite apart from France and a couple of other nuanced examples. Um, but when the directive comes in, I do think there will be a need for all countries to kind of sit up, take notice and bring in a, a, a minimum set of guidelines for the right to disconnect at the very least. Mm -hmm. Very good, yeah. Here, here's a question uh, with a kind of a global focus. So um, Sophie's saying we have a global workforce, lots of employer employees in Ireland have US managers, for example. Any recommendations in this case? Um, they're, they're planning on sharing a policy uh, and a communication to, to employees, but uh, any other recommendations? Yeah, and, and it's a difficult one because, uh, and look, just look at different jurisdictions as well. The US jurisdiction and the US approach to things like even annual leave yeah. is very different to our approach, um, you know, in terms of you often hear about employees in the States. I think it's two weeks annual leave and very minimal maternity leave. So you're, you're, you're dealing with a very different mi different mindset, um, which I understand. And look, th there is, as I said earlier, there's no one size fits all uh, approach to policy making here. And when you're dealing with multiple jurisdictions and you're across different time zones, as you would be in this case, with your US arm and your Irish arm, there's going to be a need, I think, to find some form of common ground. Um, because while there isn't a right to disconnect, as far as I know, um, enshrined in any kind of law in, in the US, um, it'll be a business decision. It'll be a kind of a almost a, a well-being decision, shall I put it that way, where um, quite apart from it being not necessarily legally required, Required, is there a business drive in the same way you'd look at things like you know gender pay gap reporting or you know ESG issues and as a business where do we stand on this where do we want to be seen to be standing mm -hmm. and I think that's probably where the engagement with employees will, will really kind of pay dividends in terms of what they want how they want the business to operate and it's not a question of everybody suddenly switching off at five o'clock just to reiterate there is a recognition for business needs and so forth that there will be scope to require out of office working and um, within those kind of um, parameters. Um, but I do think it's a question of joined up thinking across your, your different jurisdictions and seeing, well, if we can create a global policy on the right to disconnect, mm -hmm. making sure it ticks the boxes from an Irish code of practice perspective, we can probably get some really good employee buy-in on the, the US side as well. Mm 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I'm hearing great things from some uh, local Irish organizations, maybe not necessarily the entire uh, wor the workforce, but say local teams. They're coming together, they're creating their own charter, and maybe they're split across Ireland and the US or different jurisdictions. And they themselves are coming up with this kind of charter. Look, we work these hours, we respond to emails in these hours, you know, that kind of thing, having their own internal agreement, maybe outside of a policy. I mean, a policy would support that, I'm sure, but mm -hmm. then having their own kind of internal team charter. No, I think that makes sense. And I think it's, it's going to be a case by case basis, certainly depending on the types of jobs you're talking about, the types of employees, the, the nature of the service that's required. And um, so it may well be that when you're doing this policy, there are almost um, carve outs or a cascading approach to, well, if this is the type of work environment you're in, this is how we're going to facilitate the right to disconnect, whereas it might not work as neatly or as easily for other groupings within within the business. And it's how you kind of come at that in a way that people don't feel sidelined because of perhaps what they're doing and you're still recognizing and respecting their right to disconnect. Yeah, very good, yeah. What are your own thoughts on, you, know, you kind of touched on this, the, the interesting uh, new, I guess, technology or software that William Fry have adopted there with the, the pop-up saying, you know, are you sure you, sh you want to send this email now? And I, I myself just, I, I always, people will, receive a lot of emails from me at eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, so I just use the, the, in, the inbuilt kind of functioning to rather than sending at nighttime or in the, uh, in the weekend, try and just schedule it for 8 a.m. the next morning. How much of this would you say comes down to self-regulation, if you like, the, the individuals themselves making the decision not to send or, or you know, yeah. working around the hours versus, I guess, the organization engaging in sophisticated technology plus then actually almost forced regulation if you like yeah no no it's a good point um my personal view is that there's going to need to be for a lot of us and i'm including myself in this there's going to need to be a a cultural mindset adjustment here mm -hmm. um, and that's probably harking back to one of the kind of action points around training and really bringing it home to your workforce that you know especially at management level that you know you need to kind of set the bar and you need to set the example for yeah. the more junior employees and you need to make sure that people don't feel that um, they have to respond to your email because you happen to send it at nine o'clock at night um, and I think things like the pop-ups are good they're, they're good triggers to, to just just pause just think about it for a second and I think if you have those techie software um, uh, supports shall I say alongside proper fulsome training that is target. I think you need to separate out the, the training in terms of employee training and also management training because managers are really going to need to fly the flag here and, and they'll need to recognize their juniors in terms of their ability to, to disconnect and not reward those who are constantly responding to emails at midnight, etc. It kind of is the flip side of um, not penalizing someone for saying, actually, you know, it's Saturday, it's my, my day off and I won't be checking that email um, except in a very limited uh, set of circumstances. So yeah, I think it's going to be a combination of really bespoke, proper, tailored training, uh, plus your engagement with employees when it comes to drafting your right to disconnect policy. Mm -hmm. And then finally, just changing your, your own mindset and I suppose going with the times and realizing that just because we can send emails doesn't mean we should be sending emails all the time. Yeah. Now, really good point. And it kind of relates to another question we have in just asking uh, practical, any examples of practical measures companies are doing to implement the policy? Um, you know, should companies be proactive in having in information sessions? I, I think the answer, the answer is yes. You're talking about you're talking about more training, kind of more practical measures, the more communication, I think, the better. Yeah, and look, I mean, it's 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 early days at the moment. So I think it was the 1st of April that this code of practice was actually published. So it's only been, you know, um, six weeks or so. Strictly speaking, not to scare anyone on, on the call, but strictly speaking, it's it's effective from the 1st of April. So, you know, while I know this 4% of the listeners already have a right to disconnect policy in place, and I know a number of you are already working on one, that's definitely something to just if you haven't started to, to start and if you are working on it to, to keep going on it um, and get it kind of done and dusted and um, properly kind of rolled out across the workforce. Um, but no, in terms of practical measures, it's, it's a difficult one. And um, I'll go back to what I said earlier around really needing to take it on a, a case by case basis in terms of the type of business that you're in, mm -hmm. because a right to disconnect policy for a small 
10 person um, company is not going to work for a, a global corporation with multiple offices worldwide. Um, so it's not, um, I don't think it's a simple fix. I don't think it's an overnight job or or I certainly don't think it's a, it's a, it's going to be solved by printing off the template policy and the code of practice and sticking the employer name on it and say, well, that's done, that's great. It's, this is, this is very much the kind of the grass, the grass shoots or the mm -hmm. grass shoots, hopefully that's the right metaphor. Yeah. It's the start of something yeah. rather than the end. And it's, it's going to be a journey for pretty much every employer, uh, including William Fry, for example, including um, every, every listener, I'm sure, to consider that. And in terms of practical things, probably just the things that I've mentioned. I mean, getting up, even if your policy is not perfect, the fact that you've really considered it and tried to get it on the blocks and you keep it under review and you you evolve and, and you revise it and you tweak it, you pick up things like having email footers, you do all of the training and you communicate with your employees around rest breaks. You make sure it's really understood that this is a culture thing that we're not expecting you to work every hour that God sends um, and that there is going to be this kind of route or avenue that you can take if you feel you are being uh, pigeonholed into working on a consistent basis outside your normal weekly hours. Yeah, multiple communication points, um, leadership leading by example in this area, and you know, no one size fits all. It'd be different for each organization from, from small to medium to large. I, as a self-employed person, I'm going to have to draw up my own uh, right to disconnect. <laughs> you're know, badly needed. Um, Here's, here's an interesting one coming in here, and I imagine coming from, say, a manager, say, a, a people manager. Uh, if I notice employees working late, you know, do I need to be reaching out to them, emails or online or, and Slack, that kind of thing? Yeah, and actually, that, that's a great question, and, and I'll give you a proper, uh, so not a proper answer, but a legal answer. There was another case, um, I think it was IBM, where there was a similar case where this employee just kept working late and kept kind of working weekends or whatever and actually when the employee ultimately took the same type of case that that lady that I mentioned earlier Grony O'Hara had taken mm -hmm. the employer succeeded and the reason the employer succeeded was because they were able to demonstrate that they had taken numerous right. opportunities to reach out to that employee to kind of remind them of working hours remind them of rest breaks make sure that they were okay in terms of you know sometimes things could be going on at home and and, and often actually you find you know if people are working excessive hours there could be performance issues that they're feeling under pressure and they have to keep working to try and get to where they feel they should be. So there could be a myriad of different employment law considerations under the surface of that arrangement. But to, to answer your question more directly, yes is the, is, is the answer. I would be reaching out. Um, I would be, and this is part of your management training, that managers should be able to recognise where an employer is working excessively and they're getting emails morning, noon and night. Um, and it's it's all too much and what steps that manager should be taking to mm -hmm. properly address it in a very careful HR compliant manner, of course, rather than, you know, picking up the phone and giving out to someone for working in the weekend is, is probably not, yeah. not the best approach. Um, but yeah, again, that's where all of these different kind of tangents of training are really mm -hmm. going to come together um, in, on, under this code of practice. Sure. And I, I know this one now will come down to like, it, it's, it, it'll come down to the culture and the management really, but Take a scenario where there's a new role or, sorry, you know, a promotion opportunity. Two people are going for that uh, promotion. One person follows the, you know, does great work for, but, and follows this policy to the letter, you know, doesn't work excessive hours, that kind of thing, makes sure they know their rights in this area, but absolutely gets the job done. And then some, another person has always been just, I don't know, more available online an awful lot of time, replying to requests uh, at all hours. And it's ultimately the management or whoever's deciding on that role makes a decision. You know, if they decide to go for the person who's who's always on, I guess, is there any kind of legal comeback there? That's just their their decision ultimately for that particular well, role. Yeah, no, and I, and I get that. And look, look, that's, I mean, that, that's the other side of the coin in terms of not being penalized for, for switching off when you should be. And um, whereas it's very frustrating to see the, that your kind of counterpart um, progressing or being promoted because yeah. they're disregarding that. I think that'll come down to, um, to, to the messaging from on high and, and how seriously the business is taking that. And um, the other bit I would mention, and I suppose it depends on, on the kind of a, the, the, the fact circumstances um, in that scenario, but you'd be kind of querying whether there might be a discriminatory angle to it, depending on, well, is that person able to switch off or switch on, or stay switched on, shall I say, all the time because they don't have, you know, six kids or an elderly father to care for, or they, um, you know, the, 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 these types of situations where there may well be a reason why I need to switch off and I have to work flexibly, and um, that could start bringing you into 
indirect discrimination, not that they're being discriminated against directly, but that because of their personal circumstances and their protected characteristics, they may find that um, they are being discriminated against or experiencing less favorable treatment, i.e. the non-promotion, because they haven't stayed as plugged in. It's kind of a, a separate point to that right to disconnect, but it's just something to bear in mind in the background on a factual basis. But ultimately, um, it'll it look it look at the type of claim that employee can take they'll be submitting the fact that there's a code of practice that has been implemented by their business is it being adhered to in a situation where like for like they were as good as each other but the view is that this person um secured the promotion because they were willing to go above and beyond and look it's it's not an easy it's not an easy thing to advise in relation to unfortunately yeah absolutely yeah no well said I'm conscious of your time, Alvi. The questions are still coming in, which is fantastic. But I just I want to put one more to you. Um, and it is, and it's coming in from, from Marion. And she's just asking if you could you comment on employers' obligations into the future in relation to setting up, let's say, proper home offices, if you like, if employers are using that hybrid model that we saw, um, I think it was almost 80% we're looking for. Yeah, so I mean, in, in terms of this hybrid model, and, and this is um this this is slightly, slightly different point. But there's going to be so. Uh, let me go back. When we all first started working from home, and little did we know we'd still be doing it, um, a lot of the things I would normally recommend um, when you have an employee working from their home office kind of went out the window. Everyone was like, get everyone out, get everyone home, get everyone safe, you know, five kilometers. In fact, if you remember, it used to be two kilometers. Remember those days? Right. Oh, yeah. But um, that's changed now for obvious reasons because this is becoming the norm. It isn't just a short, sharp shock and we'll just forget about employment rights for the minute. Now you're in a situation where all the things we probably should have done um, back in March 2020, they absolutely need to be done. So you're, you're looking at, and I'm ignoring any of the, the, the back to work into the office um, points in the minute. I'm just focusing on the home office. Mm -hmm. So things like, for example, ergonomic assessments, health and safety assessments, you're thinking about data protection, you're thinking about how secure is, is the data, you're thinking about people's folders and files that may contain very confidential information. How is that being stored? How is your um, monitor being secured in terms of hacking and, and all of that kind of stuff that's much easier to look at when you're in the safe confines of the office building and you've got your IT team around you and all of that good stuff. So health and safety is going to be a huge thing. Um, quite apart from people, you know, the, the work, working from home pandemic fatigue that they're calling it. Mm -hmm. And there will be a need to see how can you manage your employees properly when you're doing it through a screen like this and um, how can you make sure you're seeing warning signs of you know mental distress or overwork or whatever it is and there's, there's going to just be a number of I think new um approaches to that as a result of this switch to working from from a working from home in a hybrid hybrid model so I do think a lot of employers will need to take those practical steps as a minimum and I think some of those steps will naturally come under the right to disconnect around caring for employees mental health and um, because it's not just about a physical safe place and so making sure your chair is correct and your screen is fine etc it'll also be the mental bit and and employers have a statutory and a common law obligation to protect that and I think by taking this code of practice implementing it and running with it they'll be taking good, positive, proactive steps to evidence a commitment to um, to providing that safe place to work, even if it is at home for the time being. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And thanks thanks so much for sharing that. Well, we're coming up to the five minutes of the hour and there's, the questions are still coming in, which is great. Um, we don't have time to answer them today. So just let me know in the chat, do we need another session on this to discuss more the, you know, the right to disconnect, maybe more of an open kind of forum? We didn't even really get to the, well, I know it's only the public cons consultation finished uh, just on Friday, as you were mentioning on the, what, what's that one called? The, the right to request remote working. Yeah. So that, that'll be another interesting one, won't it? Will, will we see a code of practice on that? Will it be perhaps for legislation. I think it's all part of the, as Atonish has said, his plan, the kind of increased uh, focus on flexible uh, working arrangements. Yeah, I, th I think that that makes a lot of sense. And and they're, they're, I'd say it's unlikely that there'll be a separate code of practice on that right to request remote working purely because they want to make sure it's seen as a very clear legal right, as opposed to this. Not that I'm saying this is wishy-washy, just to be really clear, mm -hmm. but this more vague practical guidance note, which is, as I said, again, still very important to um, to adhere to and uh, be mindful of and implement. Uh, but when it comes to a legal right, and again, not predicting what the what the legislation is going to say, but a breach of that legal right will give rise to an automatic 
form of redress, whether it's going to be a direction to the employer to fix it, whether there's going to be scope for some form of compensation. Um, and that, I think, will be a very interesting discussion. And perhaps by then, we'll have moved on a little bit in terms of um, even listeners sharing their own practical experience as to how they're implementing the the policy, what kind of ideas um, they're, they're coming up with that uh, that might be interesting to everyone in the group, including including myself. Excellent. Yeah, and the, the consensus coming in in the chat there is absolutely people would like it, another session. Whether that's yourself or not, I don't know, Ali, but you've been very incredibly generous with your time. I just want to say a quick thank you. There's my details there for anyone who wants to kind of follow up, send an email, um, join, join the LinkedIn community there. Uh, I always forget to say thank you properly, so I just want to do that, make sure I do that before we finish up. So, well, thanks, Alvi, so much for that. So, You're really, welcome. Really informative. The questions are still flowing, uh, which, is, which is a really good, really good sign. You answered an awful lot there as well in the short period of time that we had, so we really do appreciate that. And as well, I'd like to say just a special word of thanks to William Fry in general, because uh, as an organisation, they've been incredibly supportive of me. Uh, and the Workwell community. So William Fry were my very first partners on the podcast, sponsoring behind the scenes the first two seasons. So helped really helped to get off the ground as well. So huge thanks for that. And then as well, I mentioned at the beginning, my, my social enterprise, Park Hit. So we're, we're back in the great outdoors this weekend. Uh, so I've received incredible support from William Fry and uh, with Park Hit. Um, I was invited, first of all, to take part in William Fry's excellent Social Impact Plus program, which is still ongoing and I'm still learning and I'm still getting great mentoring from that. Plus, uh, William Fry are also providing pro bono legal support for Park Hit at the moment, as we set up, we were recently set up as a company limited by guarantee. And we're also looking to navigate the process of um, you know, applying for charity status. So it's you know it's no longer tongue in cheek when I actually when you hear me say I need to speak to my legal team. It is actually uh, <laughs> so. So thanks, Alvi. Thank you, William Fry, and a huge thanks to the audience as well for tuning in. So stay safe, everyone. Uh, I'll see everyone on a webinar or a podcast or a training program really really soon. Absolutely. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks so much, Brian.